This conference webinar. will now be recorded. Sorry. Welcome everybody to the 2020 webinar series for the HESI E-STAR committee. Uh, my name is Cameron Johnson. I'm one of the co-chairs of the committee. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Jason O'Brien. Um, Jason received his PhD from uh, the University of Ottawa, and he was a postdoc at Health Canada uh, in the labs of Francesco Marchetti and also worked with Carol Yock. Uh, he's currently a principal investigator for Environment and Climate Change Canada's Molecular Ecotox Lab, which is located on the campus of Carleton University in Ottawa. His research program involves the development and application of modern molecular methods, such as in vitro screening and toxicogenomics to investigate the effects of environmental contaminants on wildlife. An important part of this work um, involves consulting with uh, regulatory agencies throughout the world to develop and promote novel approaches for incorporating molecular data into chemical safety assessments. Um, and he's gonna be uh, talking about one of those novel methods today. Uh, the title of his presentation is Transcriptomic Points of Departure, Review of Chemical Domains, Experimental Design and Comparison to Long-Term Apical Effect Concentrations. Um, I think we'll take questions at the end of Jason's presentation. Uh, feel free to put them uh, your questions in the chat box, or you can unmute yourself at the end uh, of Jason's presentation. So with that, I'll let you uh, take it away, Jason. Thanks again. Thanks for the introduction, Cam, and, and thanks uh, also for uh, inviting me to give this presentation. So this uh, this particular project is um, the product of the uh, Joint Environment, Climate Change Canada, and Health Canada Mars Working Group. Uh, modern approaches to risk science. And uh, I have the pl pleasure of uh, giving the presentation, but a lot of this project was spearheaded by uh, Flora Florence Pagelet-Rivier, who couldn't be here today. Um, and she's a risk assessor for Environment and Climate Change Canada. And uh, uh, the names listed here are people who contributed uh, quite significantly to the, to the data collection part uh, of this project. Um, let's see if I can this to go. All right, so I know many people on this uh, call are, are quite familiar with this topic, but uh, for those that aren't, I'm going to give a brief background uh, about what uh, T-pods are, and then um, ultimately I'm going to summarize and evaluate uh, the research that's uh, been done in the literature using this method, focusing on the different uh, experimental designs and analysis methods and the, the chemicals and biological domains. And ultimately the goal of this work is to help establish familiarity and confidence with these methods, um, identify some common experimental designs and data analysis approaches and, and characterize the domain of applicability. Here's some sitting around, uh, so some uh, you guys can meet your lines. All right, so um, toxicogenomics, it's, it's been around for quite a long time now. It's, you know, there's nothing new. Um, but the, the, the promise of toxicogenomics when the term was first coined was that um, it was really going to change the way that chemical risk assessment was going to be done. And there was a lot of excitement um, about this technology. Um, however, unfortunately, um, there's been a lot of challenges in applying uh, this technology directly into risk assessment. Um, this review from, uh, from, from Canada has found that uh, the application of toxicogenomics in, uh, in Canada has been marginal and that risk assessors never or rarely use this data. And uh, these findings are similar across all jurisdictions as well. Even strong proponents of the technology, like uh, this task force from Health Canada, has reported that most toxicogenomic data are not currently well established for uh, decision making. And while there's many different reasons uh, for this, one of the, the main ones um, was the, the problems with translating the complex um, information that comes from toxicogenomic studies. Um, these data generate a, a large amount of data, and typically researchers don't often think about these data the same way that, that risk assessors do. The, the traditional scientific interpretations of toxicogenomics have been difficult to translate into risk assessment. So things like multi-factor heat maps and complex network diagrams um, were difficult to integrate into the into risk assessment frameworks. Um, risk assessors are much more familiar with looking at uh, dose response. And of course, 
a dose response analysis, the goal of that is to determine um, at what dose a compound starts to have an effect on an organism. And this can be called the point of departure. And of course, there's many different points of departure that we're all familiar with, the, the LOAC and the EC and LC50. And one that's become more common in, in uh, dose response studies has been the, the benchmark dose um, point of departure. And so briefly, this, um, this method involves fitting a best fit curve to, to your data. And the benchmark dose is uh, defined as the dose that induces a predefined uh, response, a benchmark response. Usually that benchmark response is one standard deviation above controls. Um, but there's, you know, there's reasons why toxicogenomics haven't been using uh, dose response studies. And largely it's, there's been some technological reasons, but largely it's been economical. Um, it's, it's been very expensive to do um, toxicogenomic studies. Um, but recent advances in the technology have, have really um, dropped the, the prices and the availability of, of this technology. And now because of this, um, studies with large sample sizes and large numbers, numbers of doses um, with different time points have become much more commonplace. And now this allows much more um, advanced quantitative dose response modeling. And so now we're at a point where transcriptomic dose response analysis is becoming much, much more common in toxicogenomic studies. So what exactly is a transcriptomic point of departure? Um, very, very simply, it's the estimate for the lowest dose that causes a significant change in gene expression. And this is done very similarly to the uh, benchmark dose method that I just showed you a few slides ago. Um, your gene expression data um, across uh, a range of doses is fit to a best fit curve. And based on a benchmark response, you identify the benchmark dose. What's different is that this is repeated for every single gene in the genome. And what you get is um, BMDs for all of the genes. So you get hundreds to thousands of, of, of BMDs. So how do you determine a single point of departure from all of these uh, benchmark doses? Um, there's a, a few different ways to do that. Uh, probably the most common way is the pathway-based method. Um, in, this, in this method, the, all the different uh, BMDs are mapped to different biological pathways, and those pathways are then arranged based on their BMDs from least sensitive to most sensitive. And the genome-wide or transcriptome-wide point of departure is usually based on the most sensitive pathway, often the median BMD of the genes in that pathway. Um, but there's other ways to do this as well. Um, one way that we're exploring is this pathway agnostic method, whereas you don't need to have any knowledge of, of the pathways or the, or the, uh, the biology that's going on. Rather, instead of uh, looking at the pathways, you just map the, you just look at the distribution of all of the BMDs across the genome. And your point of departure is based um, on this distribution. Um, common methods look at the, the first mode, but you can also look at percentiles as well, fifth or tenth percentile are, are common ways to identify the transcriptome point of departure. But either, no matter what method you use, um, it's meant to show that at this point, the point of departure is where gene expression really starts to, to, to change due to exposure. Now there's a few major benefits um, to this technology over traditional ways of doing uh, testing and genomics. Um, of course, molecular changes can be detected uh, much earlier than apical effects. Um, in terms of gene expression, um, changes in gene expression can be detected um, as soon as uh, hours or days after the, the uh, exposure is initiated. And of course, this uh, initiates a, a cascade of, of, of uh, events that occur over days, weeks, months, even years, and ultimately result in, in a phenotype. But the, the gene expression changes can be detected very, very early compared to the adverse apical effects. In terms of dose, um, ultimately what risk assessors are interested in are the low dose um, chronic long-term exposure effects. And these kind of effects are things like endocrine disruption, uh, neurotoxic effects, 
uh, cancer as well, of course. Um, and when we look, but they're less interested in the uh, high dose effects, acute toxicity effects like lethality and deformities. Now, unfortunately, using uh, the more traditional toxicogenomic single dose approaches, the, the, the technology using a single dose approach wasn't really sensitive enough to pick up these low dose um, effects. And so researchers were often uh, forced to kind of look at uh, higher doses to be able to pick up a signal. And when you look at the higher doses, the important low dose effects often get masked by some of these higher dose effects. So you can't really uh, clearly determine um, what are the low dose effects. When, so one of the benefits of doing a dose response uh, transcriptomic analysis is that you can extrapolate down to the low dose effects. And instead of looking at fold changes, like we normally do for gene expression, we look at the dose where genes are turned on and look at the distribution. So the, you can really, uh, much easier, you can easily identify um, where uh, the low dose effects are using this method. And so these benefits um, in terms of dose and time have uh, led to researchers to get excited about the possibility of using short-term studies to estimate the doses that can cause long-term effects after a chronic exposure. And some pioneering work from, from Thomas et al. This is a figure from his uh, 2013 study, and there's, there's several others that show the same thing. Um, I showed that indeed there is a high correlation between the transcriptomic point of departure from a short-term study, this one done after only 13 weeks of exposure, um, is highly correlated to the point of departure determined from a, a two-year cancer bioassay. Um, that's, that's pretty amazing. And so a lot of people were very excited um, by these results. And so since then, um, many other studies have uh, used different chemicals and uh, other, other methods and, and technologies. And many different uh, international organizations are starting to get very interested in the risk assessment applications of this technology. Of course, the um, HESI uh, E-STAR has, uh, has the Molecular Point of Departure Working Group that most of you are, are aware of. And the, the problem statement developed by this working group is to develop a framework to derive an in vivo transcriptomic point of departure for use in chemical risk assessment. Um, now, in this presentation, I'm not really going to get into the details of, of this framework or how this is going to be used in, in risk assessment. Um, some of the earlier needs identified during the, the activities of this working group were to start to um, identify standardized experimental procedures and define the domain of applicability of this technology. And so that's the focus of this presentation in this study. But we can certainly talk about other, that other stuff later. Um, so uh, the objectives of the study were to review the literature on transcriptomic point of departure, um, describe the um, different experimental designs and, and that data analysis pipelines, and what chemical space and modes of actions have been covered in the literature. And ultimately, you want to compare with um, how predictive and conservative is the teapot approach compared to the apical, uh, traditional apical points of departure. Um, and we want to <clears throat> compare the performance of different data analysis and experimental designs and begin to characterize the domain of applicability. So this was largely a literature review exercise. Um, so we did a, a big search. Uh, so the inclusion criteria is that uh, the study must include a whole or a reduced transcriptome, more than a thousand genes. Um, it must be uh, include a dose response study. Um, the number of genes and pathways and heat maps were, were not really considered uh, when we were doing our, our uh, study selection. And the study had to have more than three doses in addition to a negative control. And finally, the, the, the last uh, criteria was that the point of departure determined from transcriptomics had to be compared to a point of departure from uh, based on a traditional apical test. So um, our initial search, we found using just keywords, we found several thousand articles that uh, matched the keywords we were looking for. And then we sifted through those abstracts and we found about 250 or so, um, and then we read fully those articles, and uh, we found identified about 50 articles that met all of the criteria that I just described. 
Hi, Jason. It's Pierre. Um, quick question. Were those all bulk R um, RNA, messenger RNA or transcriptomics, or was there any uh, single cell or anything along that line? Uh, generally bulk uh, tissue work. So uh, a lot of the um, studies that uh, were included here uh, were up to, I, th I can't remember the cutoff date that we used, but it was a, like just around the beginning of 2020. And um, at that point, uh, you know, single cells uh, studies, there weren't very many of them, I don't think at that point. And if there were, they, they may not have met the other criteria as well. Okay, thank you. And so once we identified our, our studies, we, um, our team uh, read through the papers very carefully and we collected about 76 different data points from each study. Um, we collected things like uh, what animals were out of exposure, what chemicals, number of doses, uh, different data analysis procedures like normalization, um, what method did you, did you use to derive your BMDs and so on. And uh, also, of course, what were the point of departures that they reported. Um, to help characterize the domain of applicability, um, we used um, Environment and Climate Change Canada Ecological Risk Classification Tool, the ERC uh, 2 tool. Um, this tool um, collects evidence from a variety of sources, uh, modeled and in vitro data, and uh, makes, takes a weight of evidence approach to, uh, to try to um, make claims about the mode of action or, or exposure things like that. So we use this to, to help uh, classify the modes of action and physical chemical properties of the, all the chemicals that were included in these studies. And then, of course, um, ultimately the goal was to compare the performance of the transcriptomic point of departure approach to the apical test. So uh, we took the lowest reported transcriptional point of departure from the, from the authors and the lowest reported um, apical point of departure and we compared them to each other. So some caveats and limitations from the study. Um, first of all, these are, these are preliminary results. Um, we haven't completely finished the analysis yet, but we're pretty close. Um, another caveat, an important one, is that these are 100% author-reported results. We do plan to um, collect all of the raw data and, and reanalyze that. Uh, eventually, but for this first pass study, this is purely author reported results. So there's some inherent bias, I think, um, when, you, when, you, when you do that. Um, and because um, we didn't analyze the data ourselves, the, the data were analyzed in many different ways. So there's, there's probably a few confounding factors. And you know, I'll, I'll point some of these out um, as, as I go through the results. Nevertheless, um, there's some interesting trends that we found looking at this data. So let's take a look at the results. Um, as I said, we ended up with 50 studies and most of them came from uh, the US and Canada, but there's many from all over the world. And uh, generally they were performed by a kind of a, a mixed um, government, private, academic uh, group of authors. Although there was 50 studies, um, many of these studies included several different chemicals or several different um, experimental factors. So um, these 50 studies describe 226 unique experiments. And we define an experiment as a, any unique combination of, of chemical species, exposure, duration, tissue, or data analysis method. So um, several studies, even looking at the same chemical, might report uh, several different points if they use different data analysis methods. Brief summary of these results, the majority of the data were in rodents, uh, rats, and, and mice. Um, few human studies, but this was mostly uh, in vitro and ex vivo uh, studies, and a couple ecotox studies as well done in fish. Um, as I alluded to already, the majority of the studies are, are in vivo, but there's a few in vitro and ex vivo ones. In terms of the in vivo studies, most of the exposures were done orally, but there's a few other exposure routes as well. And the um, exposure duration, most of the studies were done using an acute one to five day exposure, um, but there's also a good representation of longer studies as well, tw uh, 28 day, 90 day, and greater than 90 day. In terms of the tissues that were analyzed, 
the vast majority were liver, but there was also uh, many, many other tissues included here as well. In terms of chemical space, um, there was 226 different experiments, but uh, many of them looked at the same tissue. There were uh, 106 unique stressors, and in there, there was 81 CAS numbers. The other ones, the other 20 represent either physical stressors or um, mixtures that don't have defined CAS numbers. And uh, we'll go over the domain of, uh, of the chemicals a little bit later. And same with the, the ERK2 predicted modes of action. Um, we had a good representation of, of androgen and estrogen um, active chemicals, um, some genotoxicity predicted and AHR activity predicted as well. And then another um, way to classify the, the mode of action was based on the uh, apical uh, effects that were reported in the studies as well. Um, so there's about 50 or so cancer endpoints that were reported um, for the apical effects and the rest were non-cancer. So the majority of the results that I'm going to be showing to you are on this um, correlation plot where we look at the transcriptional point of departure on the x-axis and compare it to the apical point of departure on the y-axis. And so of course that line down the center is the one-to-one -one, um, where you have a perfect correlation. Um, and these uh, dashed lines here are the, are the plus minus tenfold uh, border. And anything to the left of, of this, um, you could consider the transcriptomic, transcriptomic point of departure to be uh, conservative relative to the apical endpoint. And anything to the right, you'd say that uh, the point of departure or the teapot is maybe not conservative enough or underestimating the toxicity. And some other data that we'll look at um, is the slope and the intercept and the, and the R squared uh, of these uh, correlations. And so when you take all of the data from all of these points at once, um, you can see that um, you know, a very large percent, percentage of the data all falls within this plus minus tenfold uh, region. Um, you get a pr pretty good R squared and uh, yeah, 52% 50, of the uh, variance is explained only. And this is like not, not doing anything. This is just taking all the raw data and just, and just plopping it onto one graph. Um, you can see, of course, there's many different species and there's too many tissues to, to, to list here. Um, so we just kind of showed it a color gradient. But in, um, in the next series of slides, we're going to br uh, break this apart into all of the different uh, factors that I, that I told you about. So um, one of the first things we did was pull apart the in vitro and in vivo data. There weren't that many in vitro studies. Um, most of them show uh, an interesting correlation, but there's still a lot of work to be done there. And so the, the majority or the rest of this uh, presentation is going to focus on the in vivo data. And when you pull out the in vitro data, the correlation gets even better. The R squared uh, gets boosted up to 65 and your slope is starting to uh, approach one and uh, a very high number of these are falling within the, the, the plus minus 10 uh, region. The next thing we did was looked at study duration. Um, as I mentioned, most of the studies were um, short term studies. Um, they measured the, the gene expression after one to five days and then compared it to a long term apical effect. And so I have it broken down by colors, and it's difficult to see from the scatter plot and all the different colors. But what we, what you can tell, um, especially if you look at the the R squared and generally these these kind of uh, circles that I showed to help illustrate the point, is that the, the the correlation gets a lot tighter as you do a longer and longer exposure. Um, so the the one to one to five day short term exposure set, tended to have a little more scatter around this this uh, this regression, um, and the shorter the longer term studies um, got really tight. Um, R squared of 82 and slopes of, of almost exactly one, pretty pretty impressive. Um, one question that comes up a lot is um, comparing the uh, gene expression in one tissue compared to an apical effect in another tissue. So we call this uh, tissue matching. Um, for this particular uh, comparison, we only looked at uh, data for the liver and the kidney. And um, you can see that in, in the green, uh, 
is where the gene expression change was measured in the same tissue where an apical effect was observed. And the purple shows um, where the gene expression uh, T-pod was determined and compared to an apical effect that was not in the same tissue. And as you might expect, um, the, when the tissues are matched, uh, you get a much closer to that one-to-one -one and your T-pod tends to be more um, protective, whereas you, get, uh, you start drifting to the right a little bit when the tissues aren't matched. Nevertheless, when, even when the tissues aren't matched, you still get a very, very strong correlation. Um, so this means that if you aren't looking at the, at the correct tissue, you might have to do some kind of adjustment, which is kind of what's done in here. Other experimental design factors that we looked at were the number of replicates per dose, uh, the number of doses, and the different uh, dosing schemes that were used. Um, single doses or repeat doses or continuous doses. And generally, um, we couldn't detect any significant or uh, ma major differences in these um, things. Uh, one minor um, thing that we did note was that the, when you have a higher dose, generally more conservative, um, tends to shift your point of departure to the, to the left. That's probably because they're just looking at lower doses and you can get um, better dose response modeling and better extra uh, extrapolation into the low dose region. So summary of the experimental design factors, um, the majority of the studies are in vivo. So we mostly just focused on that. Um, regardless of the experimental design that was used, there was a very strong correlation between the transcriptomic point of departure and the apical point of departure. Um, several experimental design factors may have an impact on, on this relationship, um, such as uh, study duration um, and uh, which tissues that we're looking at. The next thing that we looked at was um, genomics platforms and data analysis uh, methods. Um, one thing that popped out that was kind of surprising to us, that there was a platform specific uh, difference uh, the microarray data tended to be more conservative than, than the RNA-seq data. And um, we were a little surprised to see this, but as, we're, as we're, we'll see in the next few slides, there's, there's several confounding factors. There's uh, many things that are only done in RNA-seq and not done in the microarray data, so it's impossible to determine if it really is a platform-specific effect. And it's, in my opinion, it's probably not very likely. It's mo more likely due to these other things that we're about to look at. For example, um, oh, I forgot to show this on an earlier slide. When you do your benchmark dose um, estimate uh, on your uh, curve fitting, you can authors can report the benchmark dose, or they can report the lower confidence limit, or the 95, the lower 95% confidence limit, or the BMDL. And um, of course, as you would um, as you would predict, the BMDL tends to be more conservative, uh, on average about one more, 1.5 times more conservative than just reporting the BMD. Um, what's interesting is that the, uh, all of the RNA-seq data uh, reported the, the BMD uh, and not the BMDL. So that's one, that's probably one reason, one major reason why the uh, RNA-seq data tend to be lower. In fact, when we, when we look at only the microarray data, which has a mix of both, um, there is a significant difference between the BMD and BMDL reported, as you'd expect. Um, there's different, in addition to the difference in, in microarray and RNA-seq, there's um, whole transcriptome uh, studies and reduced transcriptome studies, where uh, people have tried to increase the efficiency and lower the cost of doing transcriptomics by uh, reducing the number of genes that are actually being measured. Still. Uh, a very large uh, proportion of the genome, but not the whole genome. And uh, so we wanted to see if there was a difference in there as well. And um, we did see a significant difference. When you use a reduced transcriptome, you, you generally get a uh, higher transcriptomic point of departure. Um, again, this is also confounded by the fact that it, this, is, this is all done in RNA-seq and generally uh, 
reported using the BMD instead of the BMDL. But nevertheless, this was a significant effect that we think is worth uh, looking into a little bit more. Um, another thing that we looked at was the different methods uh, for uh, deriving the, the transcript only point of departure, the, the pathway-based method or the pathway um, agnostic-based method. Now, the majority of the studies that we looked at used the pathway-based method. And um, so there weren't very many that used the non-pathway method. And from the data that we do have, we did not see um, a significant difference here. And we were a little bit surprised by that. Um, I, I would have guessed that the pathway-based method, um, for various reasons that we can maybe talk about later, might be a little less conservative. So as I mentioned, uh, a lot of these platform type questions were not necessarily independent factors. The reduced transcriptome and the use of RNA-seq is not independent of, of using uh, BMDs or, or pathway-based methods. And so when we do a follow-up study uh, where we actually pull out the raw data, we're gonna see if we can tease these effects apart. But based on our, our author reported data, there are some potential effects here. Well, I just said all that. <laughs> so the next thing uh, that we looked at was the uh, different uh, chemical domains that were analyzed in the literature. Um, the first group up here is the uh, hazard class. There's um, a, a bias towards uh, chemicals that are considered to be uh, in the high toxicity class. Um, but there's, you know, there's some representation of the low and intermediate class as well. And when we look at that, um, not surprising to see that the low class uh, shown in uh, green here tend to have higher apical points of departure and higher transcriptomic points of departure. Um, but then compared to the high class, which generally have lower points of departure, but generally the relationship um, between the A pod and the T pod are, are not significantly different from each other. Um, there is a marginally more conservative um, estimate for, for T pods for the, for the low toxicity. Um, you can see they tend to be a little bit left of the one-to-one. -one. Um, so so th there are some concerns that the transcriptomic methods might be overly conservative compared to uh, traditional methods, but it doesn't appear to be the case based on these data. Next, we looked at all the different uh, substance uh, categories and you know the story here is not all that interesting to be honest or rather it's you know it's pretty it, it's, it's good but there's <laughs> there's not that many differences when we break it up to organic and inorganic um the, the relationships well, there's not very much representation of the of inorganic samples but the relationship there is quite strong as well you can see that the the correlation is conserved regardless of, of whether it's an organic or inorganic substance Similarly, when we look at uh, US EPA chemical categories, um, the, uh, the two biggest categories that, that we identified were the neutral organics and the phenols. And generally, there was no significant difference between these relationships, though you can see with the neutral organics, it tends to shift a little bit to the, to the right. And um, my hypothesis, you know, although it's not significant, my hypothesis is that because neutral organics tend to have um, a necrotic mode of action, a non-specific mode of action. Um, when you use a pathway-based method, which most of these studies do use, uh, you, you may um, underestimate the toxicity uh, because no specific pathways are enriched. Again, we'll test that when we, when we look at the raw data ourselves. And then when you break out all, all the different functional groups, again, there's no major differences. Uh, all functional groups appear to perform similarly. Um, in terms of their correlation between the transcriptomic and apical points of departure. In addition to the chemical categories, we also broke the chemicals up based on their mode of action. Um, so we had some uh, receptor um, predictions and also some uh, cancer and non-cancer um, classifications based on the apical reports uh, endpoints reported. And Again, it's the similar story across here, uh, regardless of whether it was a receptor um, active compound or not, that the point of departure uh, 
uh, from the transcriptomics and the apical endpoints seem to have a very high correlation, um, regardless of how you broke it up. Same, same with genotoxicity. Um, genotoxic and non-genotoxic chemicals both um, had similar cor uh, correlations. And based on the apical reports, as, uh, effects reported as well, cancer and non-cancer causing uh, chemicals had um, almost you know, identical regressions. So the chemical space story is, is encouraging, but a little less uh, interesting. Um, there's a strong correlation between the T-pod and A-pod across all, um, all chemicals, no matter, how we, no matter how we broke it up based on hazard class, chemical functional group, or mode of action, the correlation uh, tended to be similar. There was no major standout groups that appeared to behave differently um, when we compared the transcriptomic to the traditional endpoints. So um, the overall take-home message um, here is that, uh, you know, there's many studies that have used this method. Um, we, we identified, you know, thousands that have been using uh, dose response, um, and, but only a few of them have specifically compared the, the, the dose response to a, to a known apical effect. And in those, we identified 226 different experiments that covered over 100 different uh, stressors. And uh, across all of these studies, we found that the transcriptomic point of departure was highly correlated, um, a large percent uh, to the apical effects concentration. And a large percent of these fall within the, the plus minus 10. I think when, when you break it down to plus minus five, it's, it's still pretty impressive depending on how you break it up. And but when we do break up the different experimental factors, we found that there's some evidence that some experimental factors um, such as uh, duration and tissue matching and uh, the way that you calculate your, your point of departure may have an effect on the, the final relationship between the apical and transcriptomic endpoints. And we're going to do some, uh, some additional work. Um, of course, once a standardized approach um, is developed, then um, in terms of comparing studies to each other, this, this problem um, doesn't, doesn't stand out as much. And so our future work, we're going we're gonna to finish up this analysis and publish these findings of the author reported stuff. Um, but then our, our, the next phase of the study will be to collect and reanalyze all the raw data from these studies and do some more um, specific um, hypothesis tests regarding um, the impact of all of these different data analysis um, methods. We're hoping that this is going to improve our ability to identify any potential differences in the domain uh, of, of different chemicals. Uh, our, our preliminary author reported results uh, doesn't suggest that there's much difference in, in the different chemical domains, but if we do a standardized data analysis, we'll have a much better ability to detect any if they exist. And ultimately, we're hoping that this is going to, this study is going to help uh, move us towards recommendations for standard experimental designs and analysis and uh, begin to start characterize the domain of applicability for this technology. So with that, um, I'd like to thank all of the people who contributed to the study, um, especially uh, Florence paget Levier, who is the lead of the study. And uh, of course, um, this is a joint project between Environment and Climate Change Canada and Health Canada's uh, Modern Approaches to Risk Science Working Group, currently chaired by Francesco and, and Mark. But when this project started, it was uh, chaired by Carol Yock and uh, Julie boudot macon So I'd be happy to take any questions now. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, really a, a tour de force uh, looking through all these different uh, papers and picking out the data and doing the analysis. So you know, this is going to be really important for uh, the field going forward. Um, so we have a couple of uh, questions from Atish. Atish, do you want to unmute yourself and ask them? Sure. Um, thank you, uh, Cameron, and thank you, Jason, uh, for a nice talk. I I, just, I was just wondering, uh, when we are comparing the T-pod to the A-pod, um, is the A-pod the value from the same study itself, or is it from a longer-term study that was used for a risk assessment um, for any of the chemicals that are being assessed? So that's, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, in, I didn't show this, but uh, we, we've, uh, of the 76 data points that we collected per study, um, we've indicated um, whether the study, whether the apical effect was reported from the same study or if it's reported from a different study. Um, 
it, it varies from point from point to point basically and um I can't recall if there was a difference, but you'd expect there to be a, a, a bit of a bias uh, if the if the endpoint was um, reported. Well, it's, it's often reported, so it's difficult to, to say what the effect of that's going to be. But what we intend to do in our future study is um, try to standardize how the apical uh, endpoint is selected. Um, if that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, because um, the apical endpoint or an apical POD, if that's used for a risk assessment, if that also aligns with the T pod, then uh, that that essentially is what we are hoping to get, right? Yeah. So yeah, some some stu some studies used the point of departure that had, was used in a risk assessment, but some studies also uh, just reported the point of departure from their own study and only their own study. Mm -hmm. And kind of in relation to that, uh, I just had a follow-up question. So um, most of your data shows that uh, there is a tenfold difference between the T pod and the A pod. Um, is there any instance that you've observed where you've seen a lower difference, uh, for example, with a duration, uh, a longer duration, shorter duration, uh, single versus multiple dose, or uh, organ correlation between the T pod, A pod, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, another slide that I didn't um, include here. Oh, well, maybe I did, I don't remember. But uh, based on, on the data that we showed, oh, I don't want to get here. <laughs> um, we identified a, an, an ideal uh, study design. So that used uh, longer than, than acute studies and where the tissues were matched. And here um, you can see that when we, when we pick out the, the, the best case scenarios, um, we get about 90% of the data fall within fivefold, and even he, even then, uh, here the, the data aren't analyzed in a standardized approach. So I, I think in our in our future study, when we standardize it in terms of the, the data analysis and also the apical endpoint selection, I'm I'm hoping that that's going to improve it as well. Mm -hmm. It's because uh, I'm just um, wondering if if at all this. Uh this approach is accepted in the regulatory framework, what then stops them from applying a tenfold uncertainty factor or fivefold? I think that's a very good question. Yes, um, thanks Jason, that was a very good talk. I have a kind of a related question and also a second part. So you mentioned that you guys were gonna look into the hypothesis testing. I wonder if you um, also considered confidence intervals or um, and constructed those for the regression and how they may compare to the um, tenfold or fivefold limit. And the second part was, um, you know, given that these are genes we're talking about, I wonder if you guys looked at different gene models that may represent alternative splicing, free messenger mm -hmm. RNA, and how they may also affect um, the TPOT in comparison to the apical. Okay, so yeah, two very, very good questions. Um, the confidence interval is something that we try to um, extract from, from the data. And unfortunately, because the study designs here and the data analysis methods are, are so varied between study to study, we, we couldn't really do a standardized way of doing that for this author reported study. We're hoping when we do it ourselves, we'll try to come up with a more standardized way of, of, of determining a confidence interval. Um, but identifying the confident, what's the most biologically um, relevant way of determining the confidence interval of the, of the transcriptomic point of departure is still a bit of a bit of a challenge to figure out. You can do it in different ways, but um, like if you do it based on the, the distribution, for example, of of the gene expression, but those are kind of more like a, a technical comp confidence interval and they become really, really tight and I don't know if they're biologically meaningful. So we're try we've been thinking about that with, with, different, with different colleagues and collaborators on what's the best, most biologically meaningful way to do a confidence interval. But yeah, we hope to, to include that in our, in our next study. Um, in terms of the different um, types of gene expression, uh, molecules, whether it's spice Mo variants or microRNA, yes. yep. things like that. Um, yeah, we that's actually uh, something we did not um, capture in these data. There, 
there weren't very many microRNA studies. There are a few, um, but very, 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 very few um, that, that met all of the criteria, criteria that uh, we did for selecting studies. Um, I, don't, I don't know what I would expect from that, um, if microRNA would be more sensitive than, than RNA. And certainly, we didn't look at splice variants at all. Thank you. Jason, hi, Rick Paulus. Um, two questions. One's real quick. Uh, what are you calling subacute? Is that 28 days? Yeah. Yeah. And is uh, that what I, I, I took that, you know, you can you can break them up into any different there's many different criteria. I, I can't remember where I got that particular one at the time. I think I got it from I don't know if it was OECD or EPA, what those kept, but the, the gist of the story is the, the longer term exposures tend to have a tighter correlation. So are you thinking that might be more acceptable to regulators at this point? What would be more acceptable? 28 days. Um, I don't I don't know. Um, the, the data show there is a, a spread for the short term, but I think there's a strong desire to do shorter and shorter term studies and the correlation is still strong. And so I'm, you know, there might be other reasons why there's more spread there. And we're going to see if we can, like I said, uh, if, if we can try to reduce the spread by just doing things like standardizing the data analysis, it might, it might become more acceptable. Um, but as it stands from, from these data, it does look like you can have a little bit more confidence in a, in a longer term study compared to the really short studies. So the second question would be um, your whole versus reduced platforms. Um, do the whole contain the AFI as well? Because it that, figure looked a lot like the AFI versus RNA-seq also. Yeah, well, that's because there's a strong bias of, of the reduced transcriptomes being in the um, RNA-seq category. Right, so, yeah, so did, you do a, did you do a whole RNA-seq versus the reduced? Um, e yes. Um, yes, I can't, I can't quite remember what the exact result is. But this is something that we can definitely test um, experimentally when we, we when we do the data analysis. Anything that um, did a full transcriptome, we can artificially in, uh, produce a reduced transcriptome. Um, mm -hmm. I also think that the, the result that that you, result you pointed out those right. aren't independent variables, so that's what I was. Yeah, no, they're not independent. Yeah. Um, so another interesting thing that we hope to explore is the, the use of the uh, pathway-based versus the non-pathway-based. Um, I, th I think that using a reduced transcriptome method is really sensitive or the, the, the T-pod will get shifted to, to the right when you use the pathway-based method, just because if you're trying to, the number of pathways that you'll hit is just going to be lower when you do a reduced transcriptome. Whereas you do a, a distribution-based method, um, your your mode and your percentile shouldn't really be impacted by reducing the transcriptome. It's just it's just a statistical downsampling of the transcriptome. Hi, Jason. Jason, this is Jim. Um, both at the same time. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> we're both Stevens too. <laughs> um, I had a I, I had a really quick question. When you were looking at the different toxicity. Um, classes um you had a low toxicity and high toxicity um that was i i'm assuming that that was the inherent toxicity of the of the compound not not the dosing um so um my, my question is um did you look at any any compounds that never really reached um an mtd in their um in, in their uh in the Toxicogenomic analysis piece, um, or did they all have apical effects at at the time that you were taking the transcriptomic data? Mm, that's that's a good question, and I, I I'm not completely certain about that. Um, in terms of the, the the toxicity classification, it's the that was based on the Kramer method, and I have to admit that I'm not very familiar with how that is done. I I believe but I could be wrong that exposure is 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 included um, in in that classification. So it's not only the the, the toxic potency um, because you'll see that the the low risk chemicals 
their their potency overlaps with with uh, the high risk. So um, there must be an exposure component in that classification as well. Um, but I could be wrong. I really don't know. Um, with respect to um, chemicals that did not uh, show any um, overt toxicity, was that the question? Did we have? Yeah. Any? So at the, you know, if if you were looking at a study that was like a five day study or fourteen day study, and that's where you got the toxicogenomic data from, at that point, were there any studies that um, where they didn't reach the maximally tolerated dose, um, as far as apical? endpoints during that time. Mm -hmm. So not, not at their comparison, of course, to the 90 day or, or to the two year, um, but when you were comparing the toxicogenomic endpoint, um, did they? Yeah, generally, generally um, because we're trying to identify um, low dose uh, long-term exposure effects, most of the exposures are very, very um, sublethal um, and they, tr they try to keep them much lower than any like acute toxicity effects. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but j they try to, this, the study designs try to look at doses that are much lower than any acute effects that would manifest at these shorter time points. Okay. So Jason, um, uh, go ahead and finish. Oh, no, no I was just gonna say, I, I'll, I'll just be interested um, when, this is, I don't know if this is published, but in just looking at these studies myself, um, just to go through them and see. Yeah, sure. thanks. So Jason, Jim Stevens, nice job. I had a question on the, the pathway analysis. I'm wondering how that was done. Was it just pathways, reactome, biocarta, keg? Was it go terms? For that, and was for that it only particular hyper analysis, for that particular analysis, we just lumped it into, uh, grouping them into uh, pathway categories and or a distribution based analysis um, that could have been done so, using reactome or go terms or any other way of grouping the genes generally i think most of the methods did go terms um, i you know that it's not standardized of course across all of the studies um, so there's a mix but i think most of them most of the lowest author reported transcriptomic points of departure were based on a go term enrichment. So I guess I was a little uh, concerned about the comment that there are fewer pathways, therefore it's more, cons more conservative. And I think that would depend on how you did pathway analysis. Was it purely hypergeometric enrichment or you did GSEA, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think a lot of the, you know, I, I don't, particularly think that the go term enrichment is the best way to do it they're so general and and they just it's very very hard to interpret their meaning and and what the the mechanisms underlying i, I think once we get a better um, mechanistic understanding of the the causal events from of low dose gene expression and how those cascades ultimately uh, result in an apical effect and, and and we can really describe those pathways then of course a, a pathway method would be extremely um, informative and useful. I just, I just don't know well, that I, we're there yet. For I, I, was, I was, I wasn't actually addressing mechanistic interpretation. I was just addressing statistically. Your statement was that you think pathway-based methods tend to be uh, less conservative because you're going to hit fewer terms. And I think that could depend very much on how you did the quote-unquote pathway-based analysis. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that entirely. Jason, I had a couple of questions. So um, one thing that may affect the, the data are you know, the time after the last dose where the transcriptome was analyzed. And if you have a long, like say, you know, three or four days after the last dose, you may not have much of a response. Yeah. Um, I, are you going to look at that at all in your uh, in the data or study, yeah, maybe it's not uh, captured well? Yeah, we captured that as well. Like uh, how long after the last exposure was the um, was the gene expression? Measured. I'm, I I can't remember uh, how many studies did like a recovery period versus a non or versus sampled it right away. I think most of the studies sampled the measured gene expression immediately after exposure. Um, but we've we've seen some evidence um, in our own work that when you when there is a recovery period, 
there there is a shift in in in, in gene expression changes. Mm -hmm. um, so things that look like, especially especially for things that are believed to be receptor mediated mediated effects. Um, so those kind of receptor mediated single signals might go away, but the resulting cascade of effects that aren't that were you know induced by that receptor uh, seem seem to remain. Um, but yeah, it's, it'll be. I'm not sure what that means with in uh, respect to mm -hmm. calculating a point of departure. Yeah. The other question I would have is the lowest dose that were that was tested on these studies. You know, if they have a really strong gene expression response, then you may be extrapolating the point of departure, introducing some noise. So I don't know if that's something you looked at as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we One thing, it would be good to look at that, um, how close the, the lowest dose is to the um, one that one generally based. Uh, so a lot of the methods, a lot of the papers followed recommendations that were from the uh, NTP report on, on how to do genomic dose response studies. And they, I can't remember what the exact number is, but they generally recommend not to report any BMDs that are X times lower than the lowest dose. Um, I think we, the data that we have, we can filter things that are probably where the BMD is too close to the lowest dose and you'd probably get a better um, correlation there as well. Hey, Jason, this is Scott Auerbach. Really a great, you know, a great analysis of these existing data, really um, amazing. And, you know, Rusty had highlighted that too when you spoke at EPA. <clears throat> um, the, the one thing that, I, you know, I've come across and I've had real challenges with and as the field has evolved is, is this issue of how we set thresholds in a very, very complex pipeline of decision making. So it's not, you know, it's a, most people use a pre-filter, there's various different parameters that you can choose and things along those lines. And the only way that I've ever found to control false discovery are synthetic nulls, or ideally you actually run full null, full null studies and actually permute the data and go through and run through the pipeline and make sure that what you're pulling out is true signal as opposed to noise. So just to give you an example, if you take, if you take null data, so say I ran a, I ran 30 animals, right? And I parsed them out into dose groups. Um, and I, they weren't treated with chemical or anything along those lines. And I ran a, I, I ran just a 1SD BMD fit without doing any pre-filtering. I would get amazing BMDs and there, it really? would be beautiful. Yes. So be extremely careful um, in, 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 in your inclusion criteria for a lot of these analyses, because there's a size, there's a, there was a, there was an inclination to do that years back, and so some of the published data is not truly representative of a genuine response. It's something that snuck through. So try it. Take some of your data. I'm actually being you have zebrafish. I bet you oh, have a whole bunch, of, a whole bunch of control data. I like doing sure stuff like that. <laughs> I'm totally a numbers nerd. Um, yeah. I'll uh, I'll give that a try. Uh, that's really interesting because there, there are some data sets. One of the criteria that we were looking at, for example, uh, was whether the data were false discovery rate adjusted or not. And um, we found that when a false discovery rate was included, um, sometimes the, the the you get you don't get enough signal. To, to, to get a good point of departure. And so well, for these particular data, we actually didn't include that. And I know some people, that'll raise some alarm bells for some people, but uh, my kind of belief though, I'm, I'm very interested in what you just said, is that all of the various like model fil uh, fitting and all the filtering criteria, um, you get, have to get a best fit P and then your B and D can't be too low. and there's so many different filtering criteria that it would it would weed out a lot of the noise. Um, but based on what you just said, which I haven't tried, and I'm, I'm totally going to, um, that you would get nice dose response from null data. Um, the distribution of that null data would probably be pretty uniform, I suspect. So that's, yeah, it, it actually hits it usually hits smack dab in the middle of the dose response curve or the dose okay. response a set of doses and so it's it's just something that um and where it emerges from is you'll do a traditional ANOVA and you're like wow there's really no signal here and then you'll fit all these curves and you're like wow I'm getting all this signal and if something is wrong 
And so, uh, and so it's just, uh, just be careful. Um, yeah, you when, you, when you're talking about that many genes, you're not only are you going to get false discovery rates at a single dose, you just by chance might get also ones that happen to increase at an artificial dose response. That's interesting. You also get a really good fit to a flat curve. So you <laughs> fit to a flat curve, right? So. Any final questions? A lot of great questions. Thank you. These are very interesting. All right. Well, thank you very much again, Jason. It was my pleasure. And uh, with that, we'll wrap it up and uh, happy holidays to everybody. Thanks, you too. Thanks, Thanks everyone.